afternoon we have Ms. Hayden Karp, who is an associate professor and the director of graduate studies at the School of Media and Public Affairs at George Washington University. Uh, Dave has done a lot of work in looking at how uh, technology interacts with uh, activism, in particular the role of technology in civil society organizations. And today he's going to talk to us about analytic activism. Thank Great. You. Thanks. Uh, and thanks for having me, everybody. Um, so I want to give you a little background about this book, sort of tell the story of what's in this book. Um, this is a book about how data is used by political advocacy organizations and activist organizations uh, today, uh, and what it's good for and also what its limitations are. Um, and I want to talk both about the book and then talk a little bit about how the book interacts with uh, politics as it's happened since it came out. The book came out on December 1, 2016 which is an awesome time to have a book come out about data and US politics. You don't feel at all like you missed some major event that you wish you could have accounted for. Um, that's like my funniest joke. I need a bigger laugh. We're being recorded here. There we go. Thanks. Um, this is the one recording of this talk, by the way. So really, like, we got a, the last I got to pop, everybody. I know you're eating. Um, so to start off, um, I wrote a book before this called The Move On Effect, which came out in 2012. Um, academic publishing takes a long time. I actually finished writing that book in the summer of 2011. And the story of this, this is very much kind of a sequel to that book. Um, and the way that this book came about was uh, I was attending a conference called Netroots Nation in the summer of 2011. And I was about to go to lunch with a friend who's the head of a digital nonprofit. Um, and she got into a conversation with another executive director of an, another activist organization. And they were about to do a, uh, run a tactic together. They were about to put up an ad in the state of Wisconsin in the campaign to recall Scott Walker. And they got into what I refer to as the tactical conversation. Um, I come out of activism myself. I got involved with the Sierra Club back when I was a high school student. Spent about 15 years in various roles with the Sierra Club, including six years on the board of directors. Um, and the tactical conversation is when you have two activists with different visions for a tactic, and they kind of take turns describing their vision uh, and never reach any consensus. So it ends up being sort of an argument by attrition. Um, I was introduced to this back in high school when I attended four, like a subcommittee meeting and then another subcommittee meeting and then a committee meeting and then a full coordinating committee meeting about whether our network should use a petition or a postcard. Uh, and we never quite came to an answer to that, but we did keep on arguing about it. Um, so. I saw them get into this. They had two different visions for the tactic. And I saw them get into that pattern. And in, immediately what I think to myself is, it's lunchtime, I'm hungry, and I know this is going to take for forever. How do I get out of here? And instead, my friend offered her vision, and her colleague offered his vision. And then she said, well, let's test it. And he said, yeah, let's test it. And that immediately struck me as something that was vitally important, maybe sort of in the, at the heart of how data is being used in advocacy and activism today. Uh, and I wasn't covering it in my first book that I had just submitted. So I sort of thought, oh god, I'm going to need to write another book, aren't I? <laughs> uh, thank you. That, that's the right laugh we need there. Thank you. Um, so that's what this, this book is about. Um, centrally, what I'm doing here is uh, Nick, Nick Denton, who ran Gawker up until, what, a year ago when Gawker was shut down. Uh, describe the impact, the, the, the way that Gawker was changing journalism this way. He said, probably the biggest change in internet media isn't the immediacy of it or the low costs, but the measurability. And this is an image of the big board at Gawker. Gawker's gone, but the big board, I've been to the Washington Post, the Washington Post has these big boards too. And the big board is an analytics dashboard that was telling Gawker and its editors and its writers what's doing best right now. It, it was their way of sort of keeping score and figuring out what their news agenda should be. Now within the digital journalism literature, one of the things that we've seen is that this measurability, the use of analytics to help let editorial boards and journalists know what their readers want, has had some of the biggest impacts on the way journalism is practiced today. Um, my short version argument is that this same measurement framework is now starting to be applied within advocacy and activism. And then it has similar dynamic consequences that have largely been ignored in the literature. Um, to date, I would say most of the conversation about the internet and digital politics 
has mostly focused on new forms of speech. So we've had endless conversations in particular about clicktivism, about essentially what does it mean when somebody retweets something or shares something on Facebook, signs a digital petition. Is that real, meaningful political participation? Is it good enough? And what we're saying there is, OK, all those are new types of speech. We'll grant that. But is that speech as qualitatively effective? Is it good enough compared to the older types of speech where people would get signs and go out and, and rally in the streets? Um, what I'm suggesting with this book is that alongside the new forms of speech, we also have new forms of listening. And this listening happens through digital analytics and a culture of testing. And I think that that is equally impactful for how the internet is changing political engagement today. So my other sort of take home quote for all this, this is from a senior analytics staffer at one of the big non, uh, digital nonprofits. If you're not looking at your data, then you're not listening to your members. And that probably makes you kind of an asshole. Man, I thought that was a good, good laugh line too. Um, reading the crowd, reading the crowd. Um, again, keep in mind this perspective, per perspective on data and how it differs from the way we usually talk about data. Usually when we're talking about analytics and data, we're talking about the state or we're talking about Facebook, or we're talk talking about uh, large corporations and how they're mining all of this data and deploying it in ways that probably require more critical scrutiny. Uh, in chapter two of the book, I try to lay out a framework for the ethics of A-B testing and where should we calibrate our concerns. Because I do think we should be pretty worried about the ways that Facebook is gathering our data and the ways that the US government is gathering our data. But the ways that, say, a moveon.org is gathering its membership data in order to better figure out what are the issues that our members want to work on and how do they want to work on it, what are they willing to do, that, type, that context for listening, I think, carries a very different connotation and it needs to be treated with a different lens. Um, so the one other piece of theoretical scaffolding I need to give to you before we get into some fun examples uh, is what I call a media theory of movement power. Uh, this is an image from the Bloody Sunday March from the Civil Rights Movement, now, what, 51, 52 years ago. Um, and I talk about this in the book because I think that we have elevated successful social movements of past eras. We've put them up on a pedestal and are learning the wrong lessons from them. So the power of this political tactic, or really any political tactic, I would say comes down to three different areas. The first is the activist resources. So in that march, you had these activists marching to Selma, Alabama, crossing the bridge, knowing that they had an opponent, the sheriff of Selma, who was going to turn the hoses and going to turn the dogs on them. So they had their own resources, their courage, their feet, their shoes. They also had an opponent, and they had a good understanding of what their opponent was going to do. The third thing they had, though, was a good sense of the affordances of that media system, the industrial broadcast media system. They had a very clear sense that we are going to march. He is going to overreact. This is going to be captured on CBS, NBC, ABC, and beamed around the country. That did, in fact, happen. And we know historically that the images from that march woke northern whites who started writing letters to the president saying, this is too much. You need to act. Now, you take away any one of these three pillars, and that tactic becomes far, more, far, far less effective. Without the activists themselves, obviously nothing happens. If the sheriff decides to take that day off, at the end of the day, they have tired feet and no social change. But if you take away that industrial broadcast media system, if, for instance, that same march were happening today, you'd get a lot of tweets. Maybe even a lot of, some, some of it would go viral. Actually, in this moment, you would, someone would probably be uh, capturing it on Facebook Live uh, and you know, putting that up on Facebook. It would record lots of views. But the eyeballs of the entire nation wouldn't be captured on it because we no longer have three TV channels capturing everyone's attention. So the strategic insight of the civil rights movement was thinking through both what their resources were, how their opponents and targets were going to react, and what that media system afforded. I think this is critical to keep in mind because, of course, we no longer have that industrial broadcast media system. And the media system that we have today, what we call the hybrid media system, is one that isn't done changing. The internet of 2016 
is different than the internet of 2012, is different than the inter internet of 2002 or 1996. Facebook itself, we can talk about this in Q&A if you want, there's some interesting research that's just coming out, but Facebook in 2016 is actually in important ways different than Facebook from 2014. They got a better advertising platform and that ended up being critically valuable for the Trump campaign because they sort of stumbled into an ad platform that worked better than in 2014. Again, I can talk about that later if you'd like. Um, but in this system where the media system is still changing, what I'm going to argue to you that activists need to do is develop a culture of measurement and testing where they can keep trying things out to figure out how can we gain leverage in this media system. Because it's not just that broadcast has gone away and now we're all hybrid and digital. It's that even this hybrid digital space is still evolving. The thing that worked great in 2012 probably won't even work as well in 2017 because the system is still evolving. Um, so two examples of this now. The first, uh, chapter four of the book is, uh, focuses on Upworthy.com and viral news. Um, now, show of hands, who's familiar with Upworthy? Many of you, okay. So if I was giving this talk in 2013, 2014, every hand would probably go up. In 2013, 2014, Upworthy kind of broke the internet. Uh, and what they figured out was that we had gone through a shift from search engine optimization being the, the way that we found content online to social sharing being the way we found content on, online. Essentially, we had moved from uh, a information system online where people found stuff through Google to one where people found stuff through Facebook. And that unlocked an important trend or an important feature. Because what that meant was if you came up with the right headline for some serious but high quality content, you could help it to reach a much larger audience than it otherwise would have. Uh, Upworthy was started, co its co-founder was Eli Pariser, who wrote the book The Filter Bubble, that some of you may, may have read. He's also the former executive director of MoveOn.org. Um, and their model of virality was one that focused on shares per view and clicks per share. The theory being that if they found content that once someone viewed it, they were likely to share it on Facebook, that was high quality content that could find a really large audience. But the language up top, the language at the top of the Facebook post, may or may not encourage people to bother to actually read it to begin with. So then they would just do a massive amount of A-B testing. Uh, their other co-founder, Peter Keckley, uh, used to work at The Onion. And at The Onion, they had a process of coming up with 25 headlines for any story. They would just brainstorm 25. They would then take the three or four best and refine off of those to see which worked best. Upworthy's core model back when it broke the internet was to just apply that process, run just a ton of A-B testing around the three or four best headlines uh, and share images to figure out what is the language that's going to get people to click on a piece of content that we're confident once they've clicked on it, they've shared it. And this led to things like viral stories with millions of views on topics like stop and frisk. Not particularly sexy topics. Uh, for those of you who have followed the digital journalism conversation for the past few years, we often have conversations about how we need to get people to eat their vegetables. How the internet is full of cats uh, and it's full of funny memes, but nobody wants to read substantive content. The insight from Upworthy is that actually you can get quite a lot of attention to, to serious content. That people do care about it, but you need to A-B test your way to the right frame to get them to click to begin with. So as an example of this, um, this is a group called New Era Colorado uh, in Boulder, Colorado. Um, they were working on a ballot initiative. Uh, the local energy company was trying to get a ballot initiative passed to overturn something that the, Col the Boulder City Council had done. Uh, I don't want to get into the det details right now because we'll then go long. Um, but this grassroots group was working on a field campaign to try to stop that uh, local ballot initiative. And one of the things they did was they came up with a six minute long video that they added to their fundraising page that told their story. It's a high quality video that anyone who's decided to already visit them on Indiegogo could then go ahead and view. Which initially doesn't make a ton of sense to me in terms of resource expenditures. Great, once somebody has clicked on your Indiegogo fundraising page, they can wa then watch a video on top of that. How is anyone gonna see this video though? How is it going to spread? Um, and the answer is that they sent it to Adam Mordecai who was the editor-at-large at Upworthy and also lived in Denver. 
And he said, this is really good content. People who view it are likely to want to share it. But instead of a story that was titled something like Local Power Initiative, he came up with a bunch of young geniuses just made a corrupt corporation freak out big time. Time for round two. That's a better title, right? That's like a title that you might want to click on on Facebook. Now, this is often referred to as clickbait, but I actually think that's misleading. Because most clickbait stories are ones where you're convinced by the title to click on it, but then after you've read it, you think, oh god, why did I just click through this slideshow? Number 22 did not surprise me, thank you very much. And you end up annoyed with whatever site you just clicked on as a result. Um, and over time, that clickbait runs into a problem, because Facebook or Google's engineers will over time realize, we're getting a lot of complaints about this, let's adjust our algorithms. What they were doing was essentially more like share bait. That we want to identify something that is clickable because we think it's shareable. So that's a smaller range of content and tends to be higher quality stuff that actually delivers. Now let me give you a second example and then I want to move more into uh, what you can and can't do with analytic activism. Um, this is from change.org. Uh, chapter three of the book is on digital petition platforms. I spent six months going to change.org and moveon.org's websites both of which are open petition platforms where you could go, bless you, where you could go and uh, create any petition you want on any given day. Uh, at one point while I was doing this study, uh, somebody started a petition at moveon.org to fire the coach of the Washington Wizards basketball team. I'm a very big Washington Wizards fan, so I felt like all of my worlds were suddenly colliding. Um, and this petition, I think, is a good example of how change.org uses analytics in order to adapt in this hybrid media environment. Uh, this is a petition to allow Trumbull High School uh, students to perform the show Rent. Um, so the story goes that uh, the Thespian Society at Trumbull High, which is in Trumbull, Connecticut, home of my wife, which is how I actually found out about this story. She's very excited that it made its way into the book. Um, they had decided in the spring that they were going to do the student version of Rent, which is you know a very cutting edge play for 1994. This was a couple of years ago, so not so cutting edge anymore. Um, they got a new principal that summer, and the principal came in in the fall and said, oh, you can't do that. I'm scandalized. You can't do the show rent. The students organized a petition calling on the principal to let them do their show. Uh, pretty much the entire school signed, a bunch of their parents signed. They presented it to the principal. The principal says no. Now, principals as political targets are pretty good at saying no to high school students when they ask them for something. That's like part of the job description is that they are kind of immune to that type of pressure. <coughs> but since this was a digital petition at, at change.org, part of what happened next is a staffer at change.org connected this petition with the Arts Beat columnist at the New York Times. And the columnist said, oh, that's kind of a fun David and Goliath story. Sure, I'm going to do a blog post about it. Playbill.com did one as well. A few other papers pitched up as well. And now, instead of it being students directly applying pressure to the principal, now the principal is becoming the laughing stock of the nation. Within 24 hours, he had met with the students and agreed that they could go ahead and do their show. Now, I often get questions about digital petitions and are they effective? And the answer that I always give is, well, it's complicated. That's what all social scientists say to all questions. Um, but then what I say is, the reason it's complicated is because of this mix of direct and indirect influence. A petition is a political tactic, just like anything else is a political tactic. And as direct pressure, they are often ineffective because if your list of people saying I'd like you to do something is enough to get a target to do something they wouldn't otherwise want to do, then it was probably a pretty easy ask, to be honest. But what digital petitions are now able to do is that they can function as media objects. They can take these petitions, fiddle with the frames to figure out how can they attract the largest audience. And then they can also repackage them to help them become media stories that can add this other layer of pressure. So that's one of the things that you can now, bless you, that you can now do with digital petitions that you couldn't do with ink and pulp petitions that create leverage in this media environment that you couldn't create in the older media environment. The fragmentation that we're seeing online and the way attention dynamics move online is different in important ways and opens up new opportunities for those organizations that embrace testing. So now to define analytic activism, this is specifically Activism that is using digital technologies for listening rather than speech. Uh, 
and is using that both to gain insights, internal insights into the opinions of an issue public, uh, embraces a culture of testing that guides organizational learning and workflow. That question of, well, let's test it, or that, that insight of, well, let's test it, is central to all of this. And it presumes and requires scale for effectiveness. This is not a mode of activism that you're going to see with the local PTA. Uh, this is even, my, my next book is going to be on the internationalization of the model. This is a mode of activism that actually runs into some real challenges in countries like Sweden and New Zealand because their populations are small enough that getting sizable testing pools so that they can run rigorous experiments and get their significance values high enough, they run into real, real problems with that in, in smaller countries. Um, and what I mean by this is, to be clear, this is not all digital activism. There's a lot of online networked campaigning going on right now that is very important, often successful and valuable, but is not what I would call analytic activism because it is not designed to focus on listening and testing and learning. To do that, you really need to be doing activism within organizations because organizations can learn in ways that networks cannot. Um, I also want to note, so this, is, this has sort of been the path that I've been on since the book got published. I've become a pretty public critic of a company called Cambridge Analytica. Um, and I think it stands in as a good example of what analytic activism isn't. <coughs> so briefly, how many of you have heard of Cambridge Analytica? What's that? I visited them. You visited them, OK. Uh, one of them invited me to come, but I don't think they're going to follow, follow up on that invitation. Um, so Cambridge Analytica has emerged as the darling of every story of how Donald Trump used big data in order to win this election that everyone thought he was going to lose. Um, and the story that has been told about it is a story of data wizards. It's a story in which people, in, in particular, this is Alexander Nix, who's the CEO. Uh, he gave a big like TED-style talk where he was talking about psychographic targeting and how they have 5,000 data points on everybody in America. And in their data set, they also have your psychological profile, and that they can use that to target their messages to your emotional response. And they can do that on a grand scale. And after the election, we've seen story after story about how that must have been the secret sauce that led to the, uh, Trump's victory. The problem there is at the end of each of those stories, there's a little paragraph where the reporter hears back from Cambridge Analytica and says, they say, actually, we didn't get around to doing psychographics this time. Maybe next time, we hope. Um, and I've written several blog posts pointing out the reasons why, from sort of a technical standpoint, there's, there's just no way that they applied psychographics in this election. They didn't have the time horizons. They didn't have the technical architecture in terms of actually, if they had a database, relating that to the voter file. <laughs> That's hard. That takes time. There's no evidence that they did that. You'd also need a lot of copywriters to actually come up with one message for the person who's extroverted and another for the person that's introverted. And we know for a fact that the Trump team did not have a lot of copywriters. They didn't have a large comms team. And the reason why I focused on this so much is that I think the story of data wizardry, the story in which there's some data scientist who has cracked the code of political persuasion and political targeting based on data that he or she has and the rest of us don't. That's kind of a comforting story in which somebody has everything figured out. Uh, I noticed we've got West Wing, Veeper, House of Cards uh, is apparently a, a previous talk that was given here. Um, it's a House of Cards story, right? Where one person is the master strategist and has it all figured out. Um, that is, that looks nothing like the organizations that I spent the past four years studying. Um, the way that they use data isn't some grand data scientist who has wizardry, po wizardly powers and figured it all out. Instead, what they're doing is Come, it's basically like an agile development cycle where they're saying, okay, well, what do we think might work? What are some ways to measure it? Let's go try things and report back. So they are engaging in Silicon Valley style practices, but it's the Silicon Valley that people actually operate in, in which data is messy and everyone's trying to work things out before the funding runs out. It's not the Silicon Valley of some great mastermind who's going to disrupt everything because they've figured it all out. And I, I think that this is... a a dangerous myth that we keep on telling ourselves, in which there's some data wizard who knows everything, instead of people who are trying to figure out the tough strategic questions and then trying to use data to refine their insights into them. So this is what analytic activism actually looks like in practice. 
Um, this is from uh, 38 Degrees, which is the UK sister organization to MoveOn.org. Uh, I visited their office back in 2013. And this is, uh, it says up here, testing whiteboard. They have two whiteboards in the office. This is one of them. Uh, and I asked them about the whiteboard. And they said, every week we have a staff team that generates a question. They brainstorm a question. The question that when I was visiting was, how do we increase active membership by 30%? So they phrased that question. They brainstormed some ideas for what they could try. They brainstormed some metrics for what they could measure to know whether or not it's working. And then they spend the week running a bunch of experiments. Now, experimentalists in the room, this is not stuff that would pass peer review. These are rough and dirty, sometimes our underpowered experiments. But the critical part of this is at the end of the week, they have a meeting where they discuss how did that go, what did we learn? Now, going back to that tripod several slides ago, within the media theory of movement power, what I'm suggesting to you is that rather than data wizardry, the real power that we need in this digital age is things like the testing whiteboard that allow for a feedback loop so that organizations can say, OK, now that Facebook has changed its algorithms in ways that we don't quite understand, what might work, what might work now to gain leverage over our targets, to use our resources to build some power or create some sort of surprise? Um, and for them to do that, they don't need perfect insights. They don't need really clean data. What they need is just feedback loops so that they can try things, learn, and then try again. Um, so with all that being said, let's now talk about what analytic activism can't do or what its limitations are. Um, there are three that I want to highlight for you. Um, the first is what I call the analytics floor. And this is the threshold be below which analytics can't be effectively used. Now again, I alluded to this already with that, first condi or that third condition that it requires an assumed scale. Uh, if you are operating on a small, on a small scale, either because you're a local organization in Princeton, New Jersey, uh, or because you're a uh, niche political organization, then it's going to be difficult to employ analytics in your processes to set up the type of feedback loops that, say, a moveon.org or an Organizing for America uh, is going to be able to do. The larger the organization, the more they can build testing into their day-to-day -day routines. The smaller the organization, the more they're going to need to create hacks and workarounds to gain some value, even though they can't directly do it. So some of the smaller organizations, when I give this talk to practitioners, I often get the question, well, what should small organizations do? They can draft off of the larger organizations, watch what they're doing, and then mimic them. Uh, they can occasionally develop larger testing pools by collaborating with some larger organization. Um, they can do external analytics to gain data insights from Twitter, even if they aren't data insights, into their own tactics and their own organizational work. So there are things that they can do but the key thing is that this analytics floor, this limitation, creates an incentive in the system for what the practitioners call growthiness. As an aside, this is the great thing about being a qualitative field researcher, is I basically hang out and hear great words. And then I say, OK, cool, I'm going to bring that out, growthiness. Huh? Uh, this is not a term I made up. Um, so growthiness is a property of any digital political tactic. And it is the amount that that tactic grows your list. You could imagine, for instance, two petition ba online petition-based tactics, one of which gets your entire list engaged. Everyone who's on your list signs that petition, but no one new joins your list. That would be a, a tactic with high engagement but zero growthiness. You could imagine another tactic. Uh, for instance, at change.org during the six months of my study, uh, the single biggest petition uh, was about the Winter Olympics. Uh, there was a Korean figure skater who was totally robbed by the judges. People were outraged, and they started a change.org petition saying, hey, judges, investigate this. She was robbed. Two million people signed that petition. Very few of them, I was told, were already members of change.org. So that's an extraordinarily growthy petition. And since the larger your scale, the more testing you can run, that creates this incentive for organizations to prioritize growthy petitions over petitions that are necessarily powerful or fitting their, their broader agenda. Now, I talk in chapter three of the book about the types of incentives this creates within political organizations, depending on their mission, vision, and funding model. Change.org, to be specific, is a B Corp. It's, it's not a nonprofit organization. And the way, at least, well, they've changed their funding model now, but when I was studying them, the way that they operated was through growthiness. They needed to build a large list, and they could then do lead generation by selling the names of people who signed specific petitions called sponsored petitions, 
to the sponsoring organization. So like the Sierra Club could set up a petition, and after you've signed a couple of different environmental petitions, you would be delivered a Sierra Club petition, you sign that, your name goes to them so they can try to fundraise from you. So that incentivizes growthiness and petitions that are gonna help to build their list. MoveOn.org's funding model comes from member donations. That incentivizes petitions that are gonna get people already on their list and already sharing their vision to take more actions. Because after you've taken a lot of actions with MoveOn, you're more likely to donate to them directly. Um, during the pilot period of my study, uh, it happened to coincide with the government shutdown uh, back in 2013. Zero of the top petitions at MoveOn.org, the featured petitions at Move, or, or sorry, zero of the featured petitions at Change.org, were about healthcare or about the government shutdown. Nearly all of the petitions at MoveOn.org were about the Tea Party, about obstruction, about healthcare, about the shutdown. Instead, what we found at Change.org was the number one petition was about a high school student named Erin Cox, uh, who was in uh, North Andover, Massachusetts. She's a cheerleader who had been suspended for drunk driving even though she swore she was just driving a friend home from a party and she herself was not drunk. That got 25,000 signatures and led to local journalists investigating it more. Journalists found out that she had totally been drinking. It did not end well for her. But still, theory of change, totally working there. Um, but that is what change.org is prioritizing during the US government shutdown. And if we want to understand that, we need to understand how things like growthiness and organizational incentives shape the type of behavior we're gonna see in this analytic activism. That even organizations that are devoted to listening, we still need to understand what are they listening for, because what are their values and what is their revenue model. So the second limitation is what I call the analytics frontier. This is a corollary to Dan Ariely's phrase, you are what you measure. Uh, and simply put, it's that you probably aren't what you have trouble measuring. Um, putting this in practice, there are two things I would note. One is most of the analytics tools that we have in politics today were originally developed for elections. There's two reasons for this. One is that elections are the big ticket, big money item. We spend billions of dollars in the US on elections. They don't spend that kind of money in other countries. So you get very different technology platforms in other countries. Um, but along with that, elections are actually conceptually very simple. We have an end date and we have a victory condition for the 2016 election. There's an election, a special election in Georgia today. We know when that election will be over. If somebody hits 50% plus one, it'll be over tonight. Otherwise, they'll do another uh, runoff in a little while. So we know that victory condition. We have the end dates. And that makes it very simple to measure around and you know, figure out what are the things that would count towards victory. If instead you're working around on, say, gun reform in America, or you're working on climate change, you don't have a clear victory condition. You don't have a clear end date. And that opens up an awful lot of conceptual space for what do we even mean when we talk about building power or being successful. Um, so in practice, what this often leads to is a situation in which the things that we can most easily measure in politics are what we might term mobilization goals. The number of signatures to a petition, the amount of money raised, the amount of phone calls made. And those can be valuable, but they may not align very well with an organization's broader theory of how do they build political power. Harder to measure are campaign goals. Those are sometimes you can use a metric of, say, media coverage. You can try to get some sort of a measure of elite influence. Uh, as a political scientist, I can tell you the interest group in social movement literature has for decades had a, a building conversation about how hard it is to actually measure impact on elites. That's a thing that is systematically hard to measure. And so practitioners run into that difficulty of, if we want to measure impact not by how many signatures we got, but how much power we generated, that's actually, it's hard to create good proxies for that. If you can't good, create good proxies, then you can't optimize around those proxies. Um, and then the third item is uh, what we might call organizing metrics. Many political organizations, political associations, have a theory of change that involves building a deep social identity amongst their supporters, building a set of activist skills around their, uh, among their supporters, and then using those to create and leverage change over time. Simple example of this, Sort of the, the hottest organization that everyone's been talking about recently is uh, this group Indivisible. They now have local groups throughout the country. Now that they have local groups, they probably need leaders who are good at running local meetings. That's actually a very hard skill, though, as a teachable skill. But for them to optimize for well-run meetings, they would need some good metric or proxy for how well their meetings are being run. 
There's no off-the-shelf metric for that. That's something that still needs to get developed. So the analytics frontier says there's going to be a bias in analytic activism towards the things that we can measure easily rather than towards the things that are the best definition of a, their own power. And then the, the third limitation, this is building on that organizing insight. Um, Cesar Chavez, who's one of the legendary organizers of American history, is said to have told a young organizer in conversation that he only knows one way to organize, and that's to talk to one person, and then another person, and then another. Um, Mika Sifri from Civic Hall and Personal Democracy Forum wrote a book back in 2013 uh, called The Big Disconnect, where he was critiquing what digital politics has and hasn't created yet. And in particular, is worried about this process of atomization where we are watching things, even when we're watching them together, we're watching them alone on a computer screen and then maybe liking and sharing it online. But the collective work of coming together in groups and making hard decisions together, tools that actually we have tech tools for, I mean, you can use Slack for that, but we haven't seen that sort of much of, of that development in digital politics. What we've mostly seen is the development of mass tools that atomize participation. The collectivist critique, that's where it resonates the most, is the notion that when we're engaging politically, we're mostly engaging in just these atomized actions that don't build collective identity. Um, and I think there's something to that. It's not that digital activism cannot move in that direction. In fact, I think it probably will in the next few years. But Offline conversation is equal work for you and for me. We're devoting the same number of minutes, same number of hours to an offline organizing relational conversation. And one of the biases in this system is that if we think back to that earlier staffer who said, if you're not looking at your data, then you're not listening to your members, that probably makes you kind of an asshole. That staffer has an experience of listening to millions of members speaking passively online through their clicks. So he's doing a lot of listening. But his members don't experience that listening. They don't realize they're being listened to, which means that it doesn't generate that deep well of identity that would be generated incidentally if the only way to listen to them was to actually have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them. So for organizations whose theory of change revolves around deep identity and membership building, around organizing, that means they need to invest in tools that haven't been invented yet. If they do that, then they can use this to build power. But the challenge here is that if they rely on the things that are growthiest or easiest to measure, that's going to warp the type of activism that we get as a result. Um, I'll skip past that. So th the main takeaways here are, first, that I think we need to keep in mind digital media doesn't just change how we're speaking online, but also how we're listening online. And that, I think, is a lot of the transformation that we're seeing right now. Uh, the media environment has changed, so activist tactics need to change as well. Um, and this stuff can be used to improve how practitioners make decisions. They can set up feedback loops that can generate real insights into how they create leverage today. There's also the threat that instead they're going to trust the data or trust the data wizards, the, the, whatever vendor they uh, just uh, buy from. Uh, and that instead of using it to make better decisions, that they'll use it to avoid making decisions all the time, or at all. And that's where I think they get into the biggest trouble. Uh, let's end there. I'd love to hear what your questions are. <laughs>